So thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, well, why, why I got interested in neuroscience. And really, it was because I had this burning question. Um, this piece of matter, right, this three pound piece of matter, how does it create all of our subjective experience? You know, all of our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, everything we experience from the moment we wake up until we go back into a deep, dreamless sleep. And this has been sort of my lifelong fascination. It's a quite complex piece of machinery. You know, it's made up of, of these little cells called neurons, which basically are sending information. Um, they're, they're bits of information. You can think of it like that. And there's about 100 billion neurons in the human brain. And each one of those neurons has about 1,000 to 10,000 synapses or connections, which means that there are about 100 trillion connections in the human brain, which is you know, more connections than there are um, stars in the Milky Way, and that, that's pretty enormous. And now there's a lot of uh, money being funneled into trying to map out the human brain, and I think that's a really, um, it's, a, it's a noble effort, and it'll give us a lot of information, but even if we could map out every single connection in the human brain, it still won't give us the answer about why those neurons firing and those neurochemicals slushing around give us our subjective feelings. And you can think of the brain as sort of an information processing machine. And it, it encodes, again, all of our thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. It's quite complex, a piece of machinery. But the real interesting bit is that, although there's a whole field dedicated to studying the neural basis of consciousness, much of what happens in this piece of machinery is happening outside of awareness. It's affecting our behavior, it's affecting the decisions we make, and we're only becoming consciously aware of even our feeling of agency, of our intention to make a decision, after the brain has already decided. And we can see that using different uh, imaging techniques. So the question is, what's happening in the unconscious? What's guiding our behavior? And how is that instantiated in the brain? What's the neural basis of these unconscious processes that are motivating our behavior? Um, and, and again, we're only aware of this very, very little bit about what's happening. And most of it is a post hoc explanation about why we do things, which might not really be the reason why we're doing things in the first place. So how can we test this in the lab? Well, we can use stimuli that's either presented very quickly, so a person claims not to have seen it, but the brain is still processing it, or we can present stimuli that's presented in a very subtle form. So again, the brain is processing it, but the person claims to not be consciously aware of it. So here's an example. So raise your hand if you can see the subliminal message here. OK, just a couple handful of people. I know what you guys are thinking. OK, a couple more. So it's really interesting. You, once you see it, you can't not see it. I'm going to point it out here. In the negative space, it says S-E-X. You see? It's really obvious, blatantly obvious. And there is the, the bees and the, where's the, the birds and the bees. And the flowers are kind of like loving towards each other, if you can see. So there are all these subtle messages in there. Now, once you see it, you can't unsee it. If I show you this in an hour, you'll see sex right away. But what's really interesting about using these kinds of stimuli is that the physical stimuli stays exactly the same, but what changed was your perception was in your mind. So the photons hitting your retina being processed by your visual cortex remains constant. But what changed was your perception, and that's what we want to track, is the neural basis of your perception. What changed in your mind when you saw it versus when you didn't? Because the physical stimulus remained exactly the same. And this kind of information is getting into your brain and being processed all the time outside of awareness, because consciousness has a very limited capacity. If you had to consciously be aware of every bit of information that was coming into your brain all day long, it would be overwhelming. It would be maladaptive. 
But the unconscious is virtually limitless, and so it can process a lot more information, and it filters out only the very, very necessary things that sort of come to the, the tipping point when it finally comes into awareness. But you get these subtle bits of information all the time. Like, this is just thought was a funny example, I don't know how this got through the editors, of Parents Magazine. I think it's sending the wrong, the wrong message, but somehow that got through. Um, <laughs> This is a, another, another one. Raise your hand if you can see the subliminal um, message here. Raise your hand. Oh, you guys all, that's a, wow. So you all see the nine uh, dolphins here in the negative space? <laughs> really? Why, what did you guys see? So, what? What's interesting about this is that pre-puberty, they automatically see the nine dolphins. That's what they see. Post-puberty, you see this other image. Um, but you know, again, it's the same exact stimuli, but we're perceiving it in different ways depending on you know, what we've been exposed to, perhaps. So what's out there in reality does not necessarily correlate to how we're perceiving the world. Uh, the brain is interpreting physical stimuli and, and manipulating it. And there's all sorts of visual illusions. So here's another example. If you look at squares A and B, it might be hard to see up here. Um, here's, here's square A and square B. They look as if they're different colors, right? Different shades, different shades. But actually, they're exactly the same shade. And it's, this is the shadow illusion. So you can see if you remove the shadow and draw a line between them, they're exactly the same shade. And no matter how much you know this consciously, the brain still makes this approximation because it says, oh, there's a shadow here. We must lighten it up to make up for it. A similar phenomena, if you remember this dress phenomena, where right, it was sort of, it was really blue and black, but some people saw it as, as white and gold or some saw it as blue and black, and that's because there was light hitting it. So some people's brain made an approximation and lightened it up a bit, and others darkened it up a bit. So again, what we perceive in our mind's eye is not necessarily correlated with what's there in, in reality. So we want to, again, try to track the neural basis of, of consciousness, of what we're perceiving, and we can also use these bistable images. So here, for example, we can prime you if I gave you words like, you know, wise or, you know, elderly or those kinds of words. You might see the old, older woman here. That's her nose and her mouth and her chin and her eye. But if I gave you words like youthful and, and vigorous, you might see the young woman who is looking away with the, that's her eyelash, that's her nose, that's her chin, that's her ear. So you see two different things within the same image. And they'll switch back and forth in your mind's eye, but you'll never see them both at the same, at the same time. Similar kinds of figures are, are here, like this Necker cube, which you can, the face, the face of it will go back and forth in your mind's eye. You'll either see this as a duck or as a rabbit, but never, never at the same time. So the way, what we want to track is, for example, when you see the old woman versus when you don't. What's happening in your brain? How can we track these neural correlates of consciousness? And there's a variety of proposals for the neural correlates of consciousness. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to go into all these. I'm just giving you an example of some of the kind of ideas that are out there. Um, and there's an array of them. And so, but there are a few kind of concepts that have, I think, held the test of time and held and have kind of proven to have some validity based on a variety of experiments. And one is that what, what it looks like in the brain when something comes into consciousness is that you have these coalitions of neurons that start to fire together. So you can think of in the brain these groups of neurons, it's like a Darwinian competition between groups of neurons. It's like an election. And you, know, you have a group of neurons that are trying to suppress the other group of neurons, and then one group comes into power, and that's what's in consciousness, and it'll stay there for a few seconds. If you attend to something, it can stay there longer until another group of, of neurons comes into consciousness. And that's kind of the ebb and flow of conscious perception. I like to use the analogy, analogy of like a, a Twitter feed, because if you think it, if, if each tweet is like a neuron firing, and if enough people start tweeting about something, it trends, and that's what comes into our collective consciousness until something else takes over. And that's kind of, kind of what it's like. But it's important to remember that 
it's happening across the whole brain. So this is looking at a neural network of, this is just a bird brain, which is pretty, pretty simplistic, but you can see yet how complex it is. So you have these coalitions of neurons that are occurring across these large circuits uh, throughout the brain. And then one question is, well, what brings these neurons together? Um, and one idea is that they start to fire in sync. Now, it's not that they fire all exactly at the same time, because that would be like an epileptic seizure, but they're, they're firing in coordination. If you think of it um, like an orchestra playing, you know, when they're warming up their instruments, they're all out of sync, but they're not all playing the same note. But when they play a symphony, when they all come together, that's sort of what it's like with these, the, the synchrony of um, neurons firing together. And I also use the analogy of of like a wave, you know? Not everybody's standing up at the same time, but they're not all standing up randomly, but they're kind of doing this coordinated action. Now, some theories, and this is a very popular theory, this is now called the global neuronal workspace model of, of consciousness. And what, what it says is, what, what they find is that when something is presented subliminally, it activates these early parts, let's say, when it's presented visually, subliminally, it'll activate the primary visual cortex. And you can see here you have an, a spike of activation early on, right after the image is presented. And then, as something comes more into consciousness, it starts to kind of reverberate through the brain and starts to activate um, higher order areas of visual awareness and you can see this sort of wave of activation moving forward in time. And then when it reaches consciousness, you get activation in these prefrontal areas and these kind of feedback loops. And that happens around 300 milliseconds after the presentation of the information. So the more brain activation in a way, the more it comes into conscious awareness. And lots of studies are, are showing this. So one theory suggested that there might be something about this time period at when you get a, a kind of spike of activation at, at around 300 milliseconds. And so I was just showing that's when you see the sex and then it comes up into your prefrontal cortex. Um, so this one theory by Stan DeHane was that, <clears throat> you know, if you view stimuli, whether it's conscious or subliminal, you show identical EEG activation or electrical activation in the brain for the first 270 milliseconds. And then if this, the stimuli remains subliminal, that brain activation peters out. But if it comes into consciousness, you get this sudden burst of widespread activation at around 300 milliseconds after the stimulus. That's characterized by this EEG signal, which is called P3B signal. And that's, some have called that the neural correlate of consciousness, that activation the P3B. But this recent study just came out which showed that the P3B signal could be detected uh, during unconscious processing of stimuli. So what they did was they presented stimuli, all the stimuli was presented subliminally, unconsciously. They masked it. So they would show either the word left for seven milliseconds followed by sort of a mask which blocks it so you're not consciously aware of it. And then occasionally they would show the word right, which was called the oddball. And what they found is that the rare stimulus, the word right, produced a strong P3B signal, widespread across the brain. So what this shows is that this is evidence that the P3B signal is not necessarily, is not the neural correlate of consciousness, because this was happening outside of awareness. It might just be a signal of sort of this complex, sustained, unconscious brain activation. Um, and this contradicts that global neuronal workspace theory. So what next? Well, this very popular theory now uh, is called the integrated information theory of consciousness, which was created by Giulio Tononi, who's actually a psychiatrist, and he does sleep research. And what he said, and it's, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but it's basically an information processing theory that says any, any substance, any, any kind of mechanism that has a high degree of integrated, differentiated information will have the property of consciousness. So it's kind of like just a law of the universe, like, like the law of gravity. So, and it just happens to be that the brain, 
is one of those pieces of machinery that has a high degree of integrated information. And so, you know, integrated meaning that, let's say if you had your camera and you had two pixels and one of the pixels goes out, well, that's not gonna affect the pixel next to it, right? That's not integrated. But if one pixel goes out and it would affect the other one, that would be a degree of integration of information. And so you can see the more it sort of integrated the information, the more conscious that system will be. So all these studies are well and good and they're very interesting, but again, what about the unconscious? That's where a lot of the interesting stuff is happening. And most of the studies in neuroscience that are looking at the unconscious We'll look at like whether you see it or don't, right? Do you see the word sex or don't? Do you see the old woman or not? Which is kind of like a static unconscious. It's devoid of emotion, of motivation, of meaning. So what I was really interested in is the sort of the dynamic unconscious, the Freudian, you know, really rich contextual unconscious. And Freud was a neuroscientist, and he actually, when he was coming up with all of his theories, he was trying to map them out in the brain, and this actually is Freud's diagram of what he thought the neural basis of repression was. He thought you have like this information going one, from one neuron to the next, but then it gets sidetracked in this side cathexis, and pushed away and relegated to the unconscious. So the interesting thing about Freud is I don't think he was right in everything he said. But with the modern tools that we have, where we can now peer into the brain, why not test out some of his theories and see if it holds true, given what we know today about neuroscience? Because he didn't have the tools that we have now to really look at the brain and see how these theories of the mind were instantiated in the brain. So I'm just gonna go over a couple of studies that are beginning to look at the neural basis of the dynamic unconscious. And these studies didn't necessarily specifically set out to kind of explore the neural basis of psychoanalytic ideas, but they do um, in a, maybe a non-direct way. So this was an interesting study that came out of Chris Fritz's group in London looking at the, the um, neural basis of subliminal motivation. And what they did is they showed people um, in fMRI, so fMRI is looking at blood flow to different parts of the brain, they showed them either a penny or a pound, I'm sorry, a penny or a pound, and the pound being worth much more than the penny, and they masked it on either side with these images, so all the person claimed to see was these images, and, and, and the pound or the penny was presented for either 17, 50, or 100 milliseconds, and the person claimed to only consciously see the money when it was presented at 100 milliseconds, but they were told either way, whether you saw it or not, to just squeeze this lever, and the harder they squeezed, the, the more sort of it would go up and the more money they could win. And they were told just squeeze either way. So sure enough, when they were uh, presented consciously with the pound, they were more motivated, they squeezed harder. But when they were told to squeeze when it was presented subliminally, they still uh, would squeeze harder for the subliminally presented pound. So something was getting in there. And then what they did is they looked at what was happening in the brain in both these conditions. And what they found is that whether it was presented subliminally or superliminally, they had similar activation in a subcortical part of the brain called the ventral pallidum, which is part of the basal ganglia. And this is part of the evolutionarily older reward uh, system center in the brain. So what this is saying is that it suggests that there's this sort of bottom-up decision-making process where the ventral pallidum is part of a circuit that's first weighing the rewards and deciding, and only after does it then interact with the higher levels, the more conscious levels of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. And so often, the prefrontal cortex is the last to know. <laughs> or you're the last to know. Um, so I kind of like to talk about it in a very general sense we can think about two systems in the brain, roughly speaking. You have the evolutionarily older subcortical areas here in red, like the striatum, which is like processing reward, like I just talked about, the amygdala, which is processing emotion. You have areas that are involved, sorry, this is the amygdala down there, 
You have areas that are involved in memory. These are evolutionarily older. Some people call it your reptilian brain. It's motivating you for uh, going for immediate reward and pleasure and avoidance of pain. And then you have that, those urges balanced with the more recently evolved, these areas in blue, the prefrontal cortex, which is thinking about the long-term consequences of your actions. So you might say, OK, I want that piece of chocolate cake right now. And then the prefrontal cortex says, well, wait, you know, summer is coming. Maybe I want to look good in that bikini. And then you know, they go back and forth. And eventually, you come to some kind of a you know, consensus. But if you have damage to the prefrontal cortex, or which is like your brake system. And you know, in Freudian terms, you can think of these subcortical areas like your id impulses, right? And this, the prefrontal cortex is like your superego. Or you can think about it, the accelerator and the brake. If there's damage to the brake system or if it's underactivated by a neurochemical imbalance, you can get impulse control disorder problems. You can't control your impulses. It leads to all sorts of things. Um, even people with ADHD, uh, people with um, who can't control their emotional outbursts, those kinds of things. Or, you know, you can have too much acceleration, so you can have an intact break, but you can have too much activation from these subcortical areas. Or you can have a problem in the connectivity between these two systems. Or there can be a genetically related imbalance. But either way, when there's an imbalance in these systems, it can lead to, to a variety of different psychiatric illnesses. But getting back to Freud, these subcortical, you know, impulses, he was right when he talked about these defense mechanisms we have, when we suppress things, when we repress them, when we push them outside of awareness, unwanted memories or emotions. Um, and just to clarify, suppression is the conscious pushing away of an unwanted memory or emotion. So when you push something out of a, you, you say, oh, you know, I'm having a fight with my significant other, but I need to work, I need to focus, I'm going to push it out of, out of my conscious mind. Repression is when that happens unconsciously. So something happens to you, it's very traumatic, it's automatically relegated to the unconscious. And then there's dissociation, which is when you split off and you only have awareness of these traumatic events in different brain states. Quickly, I'm going to go through a couple of studies which are starting to point out the neural basis of these processes. One is this study where people had to learn word pairs, like, um, what is that, ordeal roach. And then in one paradigm, and they were put in the fMRI scanner. In one paradigm, they were told one of the words in the word pair, ordeal, and they were told, don't think of the word that goes with ordeal. So they were told to suppress it. Now, you might think the white bear thing, well, oh, if you don't, don't think of a white bear, that's the first thing you think of. But because they had this extra step, they didn't say, don't think of roach. They said, don't think of the word that goes with ordeal. It actually worked. They were able to suppress um, information. Then they had a response condition where they said, I want you to think of the word that goes you know, with this word pair and then a baseline where they were told nothing. And they, behaviorally, you can see when they were given a memory task after, in the suppression condition, they actually had decreased memory for the word roach, let's say in this case. So they actually were suppressing the memory. And what was happening in the brain is that you actually had increased activation in areas of the prefrontal cortex, which you can see here, especially the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and decreased activation of the hippocampus, which is having to do with memory. So you're actually having an active process where you're pushing things outside of awareness. What about suppression, though? Well, repression, sorry. Repression happens automatically. And that's, that's very um, difficult to study in the lab. So we use this technique, which is actually called continuous flash suppression in order to measure repression. Um, but here, basically, you just have these two, uh, like, Mondrian images. Well, you have one, sorry, you have one Mondrian image presented to one eye, and let's say an angry face to another eye. The angry face is very salient, and normally that would, that would break through. You'd be consciously aware of it. And what happens is that even though these two images are presented, one to each eye, all the person claims to see is this Mondrian image, because it's so salient. It's this flashing image. It suppresses the other. And so with this technique, you can present stimuli to people in full view without them being consciously aware of it. And they use this technique in this study where they use continuous flash suppression, and they presented in one part of the visual field, either the left or right visual field, a naked woman or a naked man. And then they, they presented in the other eye this image, and all they claimed to see was that flashing Mondrian image. And the test was basically to see where is a person unconsciously attending to. 
And we tested, they tested this by giving them this little Gabor patch. It's hard to see, but it's either it was tilted a little bit clockwise or counterclockwise. And it was either presented to the left or the right visual field. And they measured how quickly the person can say what direction it was facing. The idea being that the quicker they can say it means they already were attending to that field of space. And so using this technique, they were able to see where people's unconscious attention was. And the interesting thing about this study is they gave it to heterosexual men and women and homosexual men. And they found that, sure enough, the heterosexual women um, paid way more attention to the area of space where the naked man was. And interestingly, homosexual men had that same uh, response, where they paid more attention to where the subliminally presented naked man was. Men paid more attention to where the subliminally presented woman was. Okay, all pretty interesting. But really why I think this is getting at repression is that, okay, when there was a naked woman, women, there was no change in where the women attended. But when there was a naked man, the men actually diverted their attention away, unconsciously, to the naked man, which Freud might call uh, repression. So, you know, starting to come up with these novel ways to measure it, and then we can start looking at what's happening in a person's brain when this is occurring. Finally, dissociation. This is a process, again, when people split off. So the other, if you can think of it like pushing unconscious or unwanted things down into the unconscious, this is kind of compartmentalization, pushing it off into one compartment and not having access to these memories in another. And usually these people have two different brain states. They have one which is called the neutral, well now it's called, it used to be called multiple personality disorder, but now it's called um, dissociative identity disorder. Basically because the idea is that they have one identity that's been broken off into pieces rather than multiple personalities. But in one identity state, they don't have access to those uh, traumatic memories or events. In the traumatic identity state, they do. And what's really interesting is that they can have different physiologic arousal to, to stimuli when they're in these different states. They can have different allergic reactions to things. Um, and they can even have different EEG um, responses. And this was an interesting case of a woman who claimed to be blind in one state. Now imagine that. You're physically able to see and then keep your eyes open and try to not see, right? It's almost, it's impossible. However, she claimed to not see, and all these tests they gave her of um, her optics looked as if she was blind in this state. And then we gave, they gave her a test where they did this flashing checkerboard image and measured her uh, brain activation in the primary visual cortex, which is where the visual information goes right away. It's really early on in the processing. And what they found is in the sighted state, she got a very distinct EEG activation to the flashing checkerboard. But in the state she said she was blind, she didn't. She had a flatline V1, we call it, primary visual cortex, which is very difficult to explain, which means the suppression had to occur very early on in the visual process at the level, perhaps, of the thalamus. Um, we wanted to explore further, but then she, she got better, so that was good for her, <laughs> but <laughs> not for the science. Um, and, but what's interesting is that a lot, and, you know, and, I, and I taught I, um, a while back in Switzerland, and I remember talking about this case, and there were people who were just like, well, that doesn't even exist, that disorder. And, you know, the thing I think that's interesting about uncovering things with neuroscience is that it gives you some kind of tangible evidence. So the, these people are reporting these symptoms, but they're subjective, right? Just like consciousness is subjective. But if we can show something physically, point to something objectively, um, then it legitimizes what people are experiencing subjectively. And this was actually one of the first studies that was done looking at structural differences in people with dissociative identity disorder. And they actually found that they had smaller, significantly smaller hippocampi, um, hippocampus here, and you can see amygdalae here, than, than healthy people. Um, so there are physical changes. And one idea is that, you know, what's interesting is that people who experience trauma and didn't develop dissociative identity disorder actually had larger hippocampi and amygdalae. So maybe that's a protective factor, or maybe having exposure to trauma early on while the brain is developing, because we know um, 
like cortisol can affect the development of the hippocampus. So if you have high cortisol levels at critical stages of development, it can actually cause shrinkage of the hippocampus. So that could be the reason as well. It's hard to say, we don't know, but there are physical changes. And in just this other study, they had people who can um, self-control when they switch between these two states. And they had given therapists transcripts of actual traumatic memories, which they claim happened to them when they were in their traumatic state. But when they were in their neutral state, they claimed that never happened to them. And then they were gave the, the therapists just neutral memories that they, they claimed happened to them in either state. And they read these, these patients, these scripts, the traumatic memory scripts and the neutral memory scripts, when they were either in the traumatic identity state, when they said, yes, that happened to me, or the neutral state. And then they did all sorts of measures, looking at fMRI, looking at uh, physiological measures like heart rate, blood pressure. And this is really interesting. They found that when they were in the neutral state, you can, which is the dotted line, and the traumatic state is the solid line. And then you see this side here is the, they were read the neutral memory script, and this is the traumatic memory script. And you can see when they're in the neutral state, what you have here is what? That's heart rate frequency. They claim it didn't happen to them, and then sure enough, they don't get increased heart rate. But when they're in the traumatic state, they claim it did happen to them, and they do. The same thing with blood pressure and so on. So when they're in these states, they claim that didn't happen to them, and they're not even getting the physiologic responses to those memories. So there's such a, such a level of suppression that they're not even really responding, um, which is pretty amazing. And the question is, what's happening in the brain? Well. They, they see that when they're in the, the neutral state, when they're keeping those memories at bay, it actually, all those areas in red, you have increased activation, a lot of prefrontal activation. It's an active state. It takes more cognitive energy. It takes more brain power, so to speak, to keep things at bay. That's why, perhaps when you, and Freud was right, you know, when you release your defenses, when you let go of that prefrontal cortex that's suppressing things, it allows these unconscious memories and emotions to come to the surface. And that's what things like psychotherapy tries to do. You know, people take certain drugs to get to those states. You know, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be meditation. Um, and so I started getting interested in this. What can get people to decrease prefrontal activation, decrease their defenses, so we can access these traumatic memories and emotions, which is very therapeutic when they come to the surface, and they can be reintegrated in the brain in a neutral way. So they're no longer threatening and they're no longer affecting people outside of awareness in negative ways or in negative behavioral patterns that they keep repeating. Um, and so the, the sort of last part of my talk is that is the more recent work that I've been getting interested in is looking at how can people get in these states without drugs and, you know, in a positive way. And one thing that struck me was, was when people are improvising, when they're being creative, during improvisation. And one thing that really struck me was freestyle rap. So when people are freestyle rapping, and I know it sounds like a very novel kind of thing, but if you, I saw it once and I thought, wow, that's like free association. They're in the moment. They have to stay on beat. It has to make sense. It has to rhyme. You don't have time to analyze and think and you know, think about what other people are thinking. You're in the moment. You have to do it. There's no, so you have to let go. You have to let go. So my question is, what's happening in the brain when people are in this state when they're improvising. So I'm going to give you a little sample so you can see what I mean. This is of a rapper who, the first part of the rap is going to be, uh, it's the written rap part. And then the part in the middle you'll see is improvised. And then I'll go into a little bit of a study which we're starting now where we're going to compare rappers in the scanner when they're doing memorized rap versus improvised to see the difference in their brain. So here is the sample so you can get an idea of what I mean and how sort of impressive I think it is. Performance, feedback, revision. See, the genes are like a text with 100,000 pages. And revisions occur in the random changes that come from mutations. And when they see the light, that's the performance. 
that's the phenotype. And natural selection, well, that's the feedback side. That's about who survives and whose genes catch rise in the next generation. Yes, what I'm saying is that a rap performance like this is the best illustration for the way that dissent with modification works. Because the performance is necessary to change the words, to decide which have an impact and which to send back to the drawing board. In fact, I just did that when you failed to react. Because any line can change, and mutations occur when I improvise on stage. Because up until this moment, everything I said was off the page. But now it's time for me to switch it up and do a little freestyle section. I'm going to try to make it specific so that I can beat your cheater detection. Yes, I might be a bit of a tough act to follow with the Hammersmith Apollo. That's why the interval's next. But I'm a massive apostle of science. Yeah, that's the way that it goes with these craziest flows. This is me just improvising, trying to say what I know. And when I make a mistake, that just does uh, me rocking the the rhythm and trying to introduce a little bit of mutation into the system. Uh-huh, I might just come with these freestyle cipher and flows. Simon Singh found some nice stuff in my rhymes with the Bible code. He's been analyzing them, I've been jumping them out and surprising them, but you know, I'm kind of the best at this. I'm not a geneticist, but I kind of understand the things that they've been expressing, like every human being on this planet is relatives, which means every relationship is relatively incestuous, which this couple demonstrates. Nice one, excellent. <laughs> This is the way that I'm rocking the rhythm. This is what you call agnosticism, rationalism. But man, all of these critics have been pissing off Robin Inns talking about, ooh, godless liberals. Well, come on, there's more to godless liberals than that. We got quantum physics and we got ideas about evolutionary altruism. Okay, and some people might try to say that way, humanism is the new religion, but it's not because our ideas are open to revision. See, that's the difference right here. I'm trying to speak this stuff clear. And if you like that idea, then you can make some noise back at me. I'm just trying to scream it out with a lot of audacity. Yes, science does figure things out. Actually, not just mysticism. I'm trying to flip it to this rhythm. Yes, this is me introducing more randomness into the system. But this is my little concept. It's kind of simplistic. It goes like this. Performance, feedback, revision. So if you want to know about evolution, this is the definition. Like this. Performance, feedback, revision. And uh, if you want to check it out again, I got CDs, you can get them. <laughs> like this, <laughs> performance, feedback, revision. So anybody here can use this concept to learn how to do anything if you want. Performance, feedback, revision. So say it with me. Performance, feedback, revision. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so. That happens to also be my husband. <laughs> Little advertising. So I got to put him in the scanner. That's him in the scanner there. I don't know if you can see it, but he had holes in his socks. I don't know why he decided to wear <laughs> holy socks. But anyway, then um, this is actually his brain. Um, so we had him do freestyle and memorized. And you can see that part there is missing. That's the part that has to do with listening. Just completely gone. <laughs> Sorry. I had to throw that in there. Um, <laughs> but this study was based on a preliminary study that was done basically in a smaller group, which the findings show that when they're in, the rappers are in this uh, freestyle uh, phase, you compared to the memorized phase, you get a unique pattern of brain activation. You get decreased activation here, these areas in blue, in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And remember the study before, when they were suppressing uh, the memory of the word pair, you actually had increased activation in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. But here you're decreased, and so that's bringing down the defenses. Now this part of the brain has to do with self-awareness, has to do with making sure your behavior conforms to social norms. Um, so when you're in that flow state, you kind of lose your sense of self. You lose your sense of time and place. The moment you become too self-aware, you step out of it and it messes up your performance. And it could be with anything, with also with sports as well. You know, if you're in the midst of playing tennis, if you start thinking like, oh, what angle should I hit the ball? And you lose it. And you, he also, they also had increased activation here of the medial prefrontal cortex. And that has to do with um, internal generation of ideas. So you have this flow of information that's coming from within. The filter system is taken off, so novel associations between ideas can be made, and it allows for creativity. It's that flow state that people talk about that really is associated with positive emotions, and people strive to get into that state. What's interesting is another study that was done by Charles Lim's group 
in jazz improvisers, and again, they were played like a keyboard while they were in the scanner. They were able to kind of do that with their hands, and they did a memorized or improvised piece, and there was a similar pattern of brain activation. You had decreased activation here in, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and increased activation in the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, again, so they're in this similar kind of flow state uh, where you release your inhibitions, and the idea is that things can bubble up from the unconscious. It's coming from, from within. The, the other thing that I kind of was interested in is, well, what about comedy improv? And it turns out that there's actually been, so far, nothing published looking at uh, what happens in the brain when comedians are improvising. There has been a study which looks at what happens in your brain when you're appreciating, when you're viewing humor. Um, and what they found is they showed people like either The Simpsons or Seinfeld, and they found that when things were funny, you have this humor detection phase where you get activation in like temporal areas of the brain, temporal parietal areas that have to do with making associations between ideas. And really, comedy is to do with novelty. So when we find something, it takes a sharp turn that we didn't expect. It surprises us. We find that funny. And this part of your brain, the temporal areas, are, are, making, are looking at sort of past knowledge of what we know and new information that's coming in and comparing it and finding something novel. And then we get the humor appreciation phase where you get activation in these reward centers of the brain. Um, I'm running out of time, but slight, the one thing is just that there are differences between men and women in their appreciation of humor, which they found that um, they showed men and women uh, different either humorous or non-humorous um, cartoons. And when they were funny, they had similar patterns of activation. Again, they had that temporal parietal junction, which is about making associations between ideas. Um, and dorsolateral activation, but women actually had more dorsolateral activation, which means that they were basically analyzing the kind of, uh, <laughs> they were analyzing the semantic structure of the jokes more. But then, <laughs> when they found them funny, they actually, in the humor appreciation phase, they had, it's hard to see here, but they had this, this red peak here, significantly greater activation in the reward center of the brain. So when they did find them funny, they got more pleasure out of them. Um, and we think that this has to do with expectations. So the men <laughs> were <laughs> expecting it to be funny. So when it was, they just got this little kind of bit of pleasure. But when it wasn't funny, they were actually disappointed. You can see this green here. <laughs> But the women, when it wasn't funny, they're like, oh, well, that's what I expected. But when it was, there was this huge, yeah. So basically, women are harder to please. But when they're pleased, they're very pleased. Um, and finally, the um, you know one study, then this is preliminary data I'm presenting from some colleagues, which hasn't been published yet. But they actually did look at comedians themselves when they were creating humor. Um, and they gave them these cat these cartoons, and they were told to either create a funny or a mundane caption for them. And they looked at what happened in the brain when they were creating funny or mundane captions. And they found interesting similar parts of the brain that were active, the temporal parietal junction I talked about that makes associations between ideas, novel associations, and the striatum, the reward center of the brain. But what was interesting is that the order of activation is reversed. So even though those same areas of the brain are active when you're appreciating humor, when the comedian is creating it, they actually have the striatum part, the reward center, is active first, and then the association areas, which is interesting. So they're almost like getting a little bit of a kick because they're about to say something funny, even though they might not even know what they're about to say <laughs> yet. Um, and they also found that professional comedians had more temporal um, a junction activation, which means they were like making these associations, they were better at making these associations, and less um, medial prefrontal activation, which means it took them less effort to come up with something funny. And the, the other thing that I just want to say is about these states is that to get, into these, to get into these improvising states, again, you don't necessarily need you know, drugs and this kind of thing. These, all these other brain states, these similar states, mental states, have similar brain states um, as the improvising brain or flow states. So things like during hypnosis, during daydreaming, during certain types of meditation, during REM sleep, where you lose your sense of self, of time, of place. It allows for novel uh, association between ideas and for creativity. And people lose their sense of focus. It's associated with positive emotions. And one thing that I'm going to look at now is, is is there a similar pattern of like a kind of neural signature of improvisation or creativity across different art forms? So 
you know, what about when people are painting or during theater improv or comedy improv or dance improv, you know, do these brain states look similar across different disciplines? Um, and, you know, so the more I kind of look into the brain and how it works, the more I'm kind of filled with awe at just how complex and amazing it is and still how little we know, even with all the advances we've had now. And we ultimately need an overarching theory of consciousness so we can tell, you know, does a computer have it? Does a, does a fetus have it? Does a bee have it? We won't know that until we really have an overarching theory. But what we can do with the knowledge we have so far, I think, is we can try to look inwards and understand ourselves better, understand our unconscious motivations, our drives, our fears, try to bring them into consciousness. Um, and the more sort of, you know, know thyself, the more we can understand our unconscious drives, perhaps we can live in, in harmony with ourselves and live, you know, according to our own personal goals and be more happy. And I think psychotherapy and these kinds of things are trying to bring these unconscious processes to the forefront, and that's pretty important. And ultimately, that will hopefully lead to wisdom, which is having experience, knowledge of oneself, and good judgment. And I'll leave it there. So thank you. <laughs>